It is the 9th of April, 1945. After three days of bloody fighting, the German general Otto Lasch finally surrenders the East Prussian capital of Königsberg to the Soviets. For the Red Army, this was a major victory, as after almost four years of war, they had just managed to capture the very first major German city. Or rather, what was left of it. A British bombing campaign in August of 1944 had destroyed most of the old town, and the battle for Königsberg gave it the final blow. Most of the population had either fled the city or perished during the fighting. For now, the city was firmly in Soviet hands, but one thing still wasn't quite clear. What should be done with it? Joseph Stalin openly voiced his interest for East Prussia for the first time at the Tehran Conference, stating that after all the Soviet people were forced to go through at the hands of the Germans, they deserved at least some compensation. Königsberg was interesting to him especially because it had a port on the Baltic Sea and because it had the symbolic meaning as the home of Prussian militarism. However, the actual administration and planning process of how to rebuild Königsberg was delayed for quite some time because there had been no clear scheme yet. You see, Königsberg was initially ruled by a provisional military council for almost exactly one year. During that time, industrial machines and farming goods were transported to the Soviet Union as a form of reparation. Only on the 7th of April, 1946, did the region become an integral part of the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic, then still under the name of Königsbergskaya Oblast. Shortly after, however, during a massive campaign of renaming cities, Königsberg was renamed to Kaliningrad, in honor of the recently deceased chairman of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet, Mikhail Kalinin. One important matter that needed to be addressed was the German population that still remained. Unlike in other countries such as Poland or Czechoslovakia, it was not entirely clear from the start what should happen to them. Instead, German civilians became vital in clearing all the rubble from the street because there were simply not enough Soviet workers in Kaliningrad yet. Some skilled workers in key positions even received an unusually high salary and were tasked with teaching their abilities to the Soviet newcomers. Still, voices calling for the deportation of the German population and their replacement with ethnic Russians began to make themselves heard, despite the acute warnings that such a rapid loss of population would inevitably lead to problems in many industries. On the 11th of October, 1947, Joseph Stalin signed the order to deport all the Königsbergers to the Soviet occupation zone in Germany. In the same month, people who were unable to work were forced to leave their homes forever. In February of 1948, even the skilled workers suffered the same fate. And indeed, by the end of 1948, complaints about an increasing lack of workers at the factories reached Georgi Malenkov in Moscow. Those measures were justified with the claim that East Prussia was actually for the longest time settled by Slavs before the Germans arrived. The Kaliningradskaya Pravda writes on the 7th of November 1947, The territory of East Prussia, ancient Slavic soil which was in captivity for centuries, has returned to its true masters. The new pages of the history of this territory from now on and forever will no longer be sorrowful as before, but bright and joyful. Of course, not everyone agreed with this. Vladimir Picheta, historian from the Academy of Sciences in Moscow writes, This region was never Slavic. Prussians and Lithuanians as the original population of the region at different times were never Slavs. Unfortunately, voices of reason such as his were largely ignored. The narrative of the liberation of East Prussia from the Teutonic menace was way too important. It was hoped that the rate of migration to Kaliningrad might be increased if the settlers really believed that they were returning to some ancient Slavic land. In order to convince everyone of this claim, archaeologists were sent to Kaliningrad in order to find remains of this ancient Slavic civilization. The Kaliningradskaya Pravda writes, the objects found during the excavations are of high scientific value. Many of these antiquities convict the German historians as historical falsifiers. This completely shatters their pseudo-scientific claims that allegedly the first settlers on the territory of East Prussia were not Slavs, but Goths. Despite all of this praise, they unsurprisingly couldn't find much value and the idea was not exactly convincing to most people. And so the history of Kaliningrad before 1945 was, for the most part, simply swept under the rug and the region was viewed as some kind of terra nullius. Everything that was considered to be German was seen in a very negative light. It therefore only made sense that the rebuilt Kaliningrad should move away from its past and receive a new identity, 
The Kaliningradskaya Pravda writes again, It is important to note that the city center was constructed by Germans unsystematically and in a barbarian way. In general, this is characteristic of all capitalist cities. There are many streets so narrow that a tram can barely move along. Wide avenues and tree-lined boulevards will replace these streets and buildings. What was generally criticized the most were the bad conditions in working class areas, the unequal levels of luxury in the various districts, and the outdated buildings. The reconstruction of a new city was therefore supposed to be a victory over the capitalist fascists. A very prevalent idea that many post-war architects in the Soviet Union shared was that the material surroundings have a significant impact on the way a person acts and thinks. The socialist space should, for one, satisfy basic needs by providing accommodations, laundrettes, daycare facilities and other things like that. Alongside that, it should also give its citizens something to identify with, such as statues and other monuments. The chief architect of Kaliningrad, Dmitry Konstantinovich Navalikhin, argued that simply rebuilding the old town was completely out of the question and that something new should be constructed. Not everyone agreed with Navalikhin. One participant in the first General Assembly of Kaliningrad Architects on September 8, 1948, argued that the complete change of the Prussian face of the city was a hardly noticeable, ineffective and, moreover, impossible method. Others argued that the reconstruction effort should focus on building as many new flats as humanly possible in order to solve the housing crisis. Some architects even argued that the destroyed city centre should be turned into an open-air museum, which would simultaneously serve as a reminder of the horrors of the war. It didn't really matter because funding was scarce and other Soviet cities also needed to be rebuilt. So in the late 1940s it was mostly just house facades that were slightly changed. Still, Navalikin wasn't deterred. Together with the National Institute of Urban Planning in Moscow, he drafted an ambitious plan in 1949. Some of the most important aspects of that plan are as follows. 1. Widen all of the old medieval roads. 2. Build a massive park on the Pregel Island. 3. Tear down the old Königsberg castle and build a representative house of the Soviets. 4. Build a massive transit road from north to south through the old city centre. Navalikin was heavily inspired by the city of Moscow and wanted to create a sort of sister city. The transit road was supposed to resemble the capital's Gorky Street. He also planned to tear down Kaliningrad's old fortification system and build a ring road around it instead, again similar to the ring road in Moscow. All of these roads were supposed to be accompanied by beautiful houses and the new house of the Soviets was initially planned to resemble the state university in Moscow. However, due to the previously mentioned funding problem, Navalikin had to compromise. The transit road was indeed built, but instead of nice buildings, simple housing blocks were constructed along it. The ring road was never built and the construction of the house of the Soviets was delayed for a very long time. Housing also remained a huge issue throughout the reconstruction period. Because of its weird status as a liberated war trophy instead of a proper Soviet city, the state planning commission called Gosplan decided to cut funding from Moscow. The fact that resources and industrial machines were still being carried into the rest of the country well into the 1940s didn't help either. By 1955, only 2,400 square meters instead of the initially planned 4,000 square meters of housing area were built. Most of these houses for the workers were constructed by the factories they worked in themselves. And those factories often didn't manage to build enough flats or they were simply far away from the city center. The situation massively improved after Nikita Khrushchev visited Kaliningrad as the very first ever Soviet head of state in 1957. After that, the city councils were made responsible for constructing apartments and, indeed, between 1956 and 1963, the Soviet Union had the highest rate of built houses per capita in the world. Those houses were given the name Khrushchevka, even though Khrushchev obviously wasn't the one who designed those new houses. Instead, that honor belongs to Vitaly Lagutenko, an engineer from Moscow who had been experimenting with low-cost buildings for quite a few years now. Khrushchevki were usually five-story tall houses built with prefabricated slabs of concrete. They were in no way luxurious and the insulation was notoriously terrible, but to many people having their own modern flats was like a dream come true and those Khrushchevki were very easy and cheap to build. They were often built as part of a so-called microrayon or micro-district outside of the city centre. A microrayon was a district with about 5,000 to 20,000 inhabitants and it had virtually everything you would ever need. A kindergarten, daycare centres, cafeterias and free time infrastructure. 
Sounds nice, but once again, Kaliningrad was a special case. Only a small part of the planned 380,000 square meters of housing were actually built, and many Kaliningraders felt betrayed. We know of a group of some party members who came back home after a short trip to rebuild East Berlin in 1960, and then openly voiced their disappointment about the fact that their city still had so, so much to do. Another indication of Kaliningrad's slow rebuilding process were the countless movies about the Second World War that were filmed in front of the ruins. Famous examples include Encounter at the Elbe from 1948, Father of a Soldier from 1964, and Spring on the Order from 1967. Let's talk about monuments now, because those were seen as vital to legitimizing the existence of Soviet Kaliningrad. According to Navalikin, they should emphasize and assert the new Russian socialist essence of the city. The very first monument was a memorial to 1,200 soldiers from the 11th Guard Army who had lost their lives during the Battle of Königsberg. The memorial was built next to the northern train station in September of 1945, and it was a 26 meter tall obelisk. It quickly became an important symbol for the reconstruction of the city, and was for a long time considered one of its main attractions. Of course, Kaliningrad also received a statue of Stalin in 1953, but that was removed just nine years later during the years of de-Stalinization. In 1959, Mikhail Kalinin himself got a huge statue as well. Other statues were not so welcome. All the statues of Otto von Bismarck and of the German Kaisers were removed without exception. The only exception remained the grave of the philosopher Immanuel Kant. His grave had been vandalized by Soviet soldiers with thoughtful remarks such as Did you think that the Russian Ivan would bow down to your ashes? But it was quickly added to the list of cultural monuments. Because of the grave, the Königsberg Cathedral was luckily not torn down like less fortunate Prussian buildings, even if it wasn't reconstructed until after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So, as you can see, the Kaliningrad administrators were ready to preserve some of the city's old town if it was of high international importance. A very heated discussion therefore arose about what should happen to the Königsberg Castle, which had been destroyed greatly during the war. As you know now, Navalikin planned to tear down the castle and instead build a house of the Soviets. Funding had been scarce and many architects argued about what exactly should happen to the ruins. Therefore, an architectural contest was held in 1964, with one submission from Giprogor in Moscow, four submissions from Lithuanian architects, and one submission from city planners in Kiev. All of those submissions, except for the one from Moscow, intended to preserve the ruins of the castle. Vladimir Vasilievich Khodakovsky, who had become the chief architect in 1961, was one of the main opponents against the castle's destruction. He wrote in the Kaliningradskaya Pravda, It would make sense to use simple means to transform the ruins into a monument against the devastating wars, into a call for friendship between nations. For example, through the illuminated silhouettes of a dove of peace, a crossed-out bomb, a man reforging a sword into a plowshare, or a mother pressing her child to her heart. Those gigantic silhouettes against the backgrounds of the castle ruins could create an architectural and artistic image unique in its impressiveness. Others argued that the castle was a clear symbol of German Königsberg, which stood right in the middle of the city. Jakov Andreevich Prushinsky, the chairman of the executive committee of the Kaliningrad region, writes in a letter to the Council of Ministers of Russia, We propose that the remains of the royal castle, built by the Knights of the Teutonic Order, as a bastion of aggressive campaigns against Lithuanians, Poles and Russians, be destroyed. The castle has always been an embodiment of the predatory aspirations, first of the Knights and then of the Fascists against the Slavic people. Revanchists in Western Germany write scientific treatises devoted to the role of the castle in the history of the creation of Prussia, and only they will be grateful to us for its restoration. This is why we consider that the destruction of the ruins of the castle will mean a final celebration of historical justice. In the end, those who tried to save the castle were unable to propose a satisfying solution to what should be done with it, and in 1968, Leonid Brezhnev ordered the demolition of what was left of it. In 1970, the construction of the House of the Soviets began. It can almost be considered irony, but because this giant building was built on top of medieval ruins, its foundation was incredibly unstable, and the construction had to be put on hold. And to this very day, the House of the Soviets remains unfinished and will most likely be torn down in the next few years, because trying to fix this monstrosity would cost more than it will be worth. The failure of the House of Soviets is sometimes jokingly called the 
Revenge of the Prussians. Kaliningrad is one of many tragic examples in Europe that clearly show just how much beautiful architecture and expressions of culture we've really lost during the Second World War, as a direct consequence of German aggression. And as you can see now, there were many different opinions in the post-war Soviet Union about how the city should be rebuilt exactly. It was largely due to financial and ideological reasons that Kaliningrad looks the way it does now. However, there's some hope. Countless historical buildings have been renovated in recent years. The Fischdorf has been rebuilt, and there are many architects who are calling for a complete redesign of the city centre. As of right now with the war, however, Kaliningrad's future remains uncertain. But it will be an interesting piece of land to observe in the next few years. Alright then, danke schön for watching the video, and I hope you've learned something. If you did, a like and a subscribe are always appreciated. A very special and grateful thanks goes out to A Cup of Tea, Drix, and Tristan Kriegsmann for their generous support over on Ko-Fi. You are fantastic. Have a very wonderful day, and see you next time.